Motion to return to public session, please. Motion. Second. Motion. Motion. Second. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. We're in public session, ma'am. So we are going to start back with community, with, I'm sorry, with committee reports. Um, do we have a committee report from you, um, Warren Mitchell? You the report, sir. Yes, I do. So a couple of things I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Um, mm, I did, yeah, I did a, do a tour a couple of buildings in our district past the Frida or uh, the Ida, Frida, the Ida uh, uh, water damage from floods. Uh, we spoke closely, communicated with um, Mike uh, Policcio, Ken Baviallo to make sure that uh, we were on point with getting our, uh, our repairs done. So I'm staying close in contact with them for those repairs that are still on their way and close to being finished. Um, we also had several different agendas that we discussed at some of our meetings. Um, as far as the, uh, today we had a health and wellness where we talked about the our robust breakfast, which is rolling out on October 1st, which means hot breakfast and a, a new whole brand new overhaul lunch menu, which is going to be starting October 1st, got pushed back a little bit because of the storm and everything like that. Um, so, you know, we're going to start seeing some really, some really intense, intense uh, menus for our students uh, to they're going to get to eat. Uh, they're going to eat better than some of, some of us adults here. Basically, the school lunch, they're going to come in for breakfast and lunch is going to be something they're going to be happy to have. Um, we What's have other topics to say again. Well, it's going to start October 4th. That's a Monday. Okay, thank you. Okay. October 4th, right. Okay. Um, for the most part, just still pushing forward with, of course, the repairs in our district and our buildings. Um, that's still going to be a topic that we're going to continue to keep pushing forward with. I was in contact with uh, Mr. Policio this morning about uh, benches at the soccer field, which I was reported was uh, were damaged. <clears throat> and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Policio told me that those benches were removed and, you know, certain things about how things look, how our place looks. You come to our fields, you want it to look beautiful. You come watch a good game, you want to be in a nice surrounding when you sit down. We talked about that and he's going to be addressing some other topics uh, that we discussed about the soccer field and um, just making the landscape look like it's supposed to. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, and just there were some meetings we had also. Uh, regarding the the rollout for the for the for the lunch plan and how things are going to go as far as grab and go when we had to do it for the for the one week all of this was also based behind the Ida uh, delays the damage the flood uh, damage in our different buildings and um, and keep in mind even though though it seems like it's a week or two weeks ago we're still very much working to get get back to get all of that stuff the damage that we and, and, and that we took in was extensive uh, in many of our buildings so. Um, the questions will come in and we'll be able to definitely answer them. And Mike, uh, Mr. Police Show and uh, Mr. Baviello will continue to keep us abreast of all of that. Thank That's you. That's all I got. Thank I have you. a question, a Trustee Mitchell. Yes. Uh, my question is, or maybe for um, Mr. Police Show, but two things. I've been getting calls from the Pennington community, more complaints about the parking. guys in the basketball courts cursing and smoking pot and all this stuff. So, so anyway, I'm, we were yes. going to we were going to put up signs. We were going to get yes. them done. Yes. So where are they? Because I, I don't want to be made a liar. Right. So happy that you brought that up, trustee. So I just showed the superintendent last week. We received, I believe, 55 two by three metal signs that have all those rules and regulations on it. We just got funding it um, for it. They're in place and they will start going up as early as Monday. I have. Uh, I also have a, a comment about the Pennington um, parking. Uh, when when parents are dropping off their kids, I think they're parking and they're blocking people's driveways. People can't get out. They're blocking up the street. So I don't know how um, the. I don't know how the maybe the entrance should go around that whatever Ridgeway or whatever that street is because Devonia Avenue it gets crazy in the morning and people are double parking. 
parking in people's driveways, blocking their drivers when they're trying to get out to work. So I'm getting a lot of complaints about that. So is there any way uh, you, Mike, or can, um, can coordinate with the principals or somehow figure out that we can get that traffic flowing in the morning? Can I answer that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we can definitely look at that. I do know the first day of school, it was atrocious. I was there. It was, if I had not been there to see it myself, I would not have believed how bad it was. Um, and the police were there. I think too, right? Say it again. It rained that day as well. And it, exactly. So that made it worse. Um, but so I can certainly understand and appreciate the concerns of the citizens and neighbors there. Um, it was an incredibly invasive uh, drop-off day, first day. Some oh, yeah. of which I think could have been avoided if we had communicated better to parents. Uh, this is where your child will be on the first day of school. This is who your teacher is. So I did speak with all the principals about that yesterday, day before yesterday now. I think it's still happening over there at Pennington. The yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's more than that because um, like the Devonia Avenue entrance in which we have the driveway that we could go around and drop off our kids. That's getting seriously congested and people, um, number one, taking too long to, to drop off the kids or parking in a way in which traffic in that entrance, that parking lot cannot get out. And then the other one is people are even double parking and it's on both sides. So the traffic cannot go through and it's chaotic. Every morning is chaotic. It's, and it's been there for a while. It has been happening for a while. I did send out a message to the Pennington community on behalf of um, people who live in that area based on one, what they've communicated to me by way of calls, phone calls or emails. Uh, also based on what I experienced firsthand. Uh, Trustee Sorensen is absolutely correct. There is a degree of uh, just common courtesy that we need people to exercise when they're dropping their kids off. Um, some of it is gonna be unavoidable, quite frankly, if people don't police themselves, um, but we will look at the logistics and make sure that the drop-off ramps are sufficient for the volume there. Um, and I keep, I thought the first day, okay, it's raining, today is an anomaly, and it won't, you know, it'll subside to some extent, and people drop their kids off because they didn't want them walking in the rain, which I get. Um, but to the extent that it is still continuing at that point, maybe we have to reassess or even look at restructuring drop-off times, um, if that will, will help, that will create probably another host of issues for people who schedule their work day around that. Um, but that's something we may want to look at and perhaps we can engage the PTA in the conversation uh, about reaching out to their parents and how to make that make sense. Well, what, yeah, well, that was the other thing I had well, mentioned. How, well, how about just parking somewhere and walking your child into the building? Isn't that an option? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's called parking in front of people's driveways. Yeah, just get out of their homes and all the grass. So park. hold on one, wait, one second, one second. So, the re so let's be, I mean, it's been much better since the message went out. Let's start with that, right? People's driveways have, I have not seen during pickup or drop off people's driveways being blocked in the same manner. What I do see is right on Devonia on our, on Pennington side, people are parking, which then makes a two way street with parking only on one side, effectively a one way street. And eventually what happens is there's a bus or a, it's a school bus or a bus, somebody with a big truck comes by. And then now we have this log jam of cars trying to go in every direction. And the fact of the matter is it's just not big enough. Like literally the street is not large enough to have cars parked on either side and cars going in both directions. Well, why so, don't, my question was, why don't they go in on the other side? Isn't there the other side? Yeah, but of the kids are broken up now. So if your kid is, if, if you have a second, third or fourth grader, you only, you're going to go to the Devonia entrance. Mm -hmm. And then if your child is a kindergartner or a pre-K or a first grader, they're in the front. And then if you have a fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth, I think they're on the other side. Yeah, on the other side. Um, and so, again, I think part of it was in the beginning, it was confusion. And then I think people get used to doing, you know, I get used to walking the two. I mean, I park around the corner down the block because I don't, you know, my husband got, I don't know, a sideswipe one day last year. And that was enough for me. Um, but we do need to convey that we cannot, because I don't think it's as much blocking the driveways as blocking, like, because I think that's a fire lane too. And I bet you when you call the police, yeah, it's just they use that. 
Correct. But that's what I'm saying. Like, in, and, and if there's an emergency on the other side of town, we're going to have police and firefighters stuck in that. That's going to be the issue. Right. Something, God forbid, is going to happen to somebody because they can't get to where they need to go. Okay. All right, I have really quick, just one last thing I want to say really fast. Dads bring your kids to school day is this week. Can can I get tomorrow. a confirmation? Septu- is it tomorrow? I, so, uh, and, I'm, and I'm saying this on in public and public hearing because check with your, your PTA, your parent liaison. You should be checking. You, you should have got something in the, in the book bag as the way of a flyer. You might have got something on Schoology, but it is happening. And then if I'm not mistaken, every school in our district is doing something special for dads, whether it's donuts and coffee, or it's just a quick something special to say thank you and it's good to see you. Uh, please be on the lookout what for that. Time? What time is it? You know? it's, thir- it's Thursday. It's Thursday. It's Thursday? Okay. I thought it was tomorrow. Yes. It's August. I it's think it's September the difference. 23rd. Yeah. That's, that's th- that's th- and what time is it? For most schools, it's uh, just drop it's off. Eight, it's- yeah, it's at, it's at 8.30, yeah. basically, at drop off time. It's only about 15 minutes, 20 minutes at tops. Okay. All right. So schools um, are doing different things. All right. So do we have a um, report from Ms. Munoz? Ms. Munoz? Hi. Okay, so I have two reports. So first report is the budget committee. Um, we met and we went over um, kind of budget planning and the process going forward, um, budget planning for this particular school buildings, where we are in the collection process from the city um, for the outstanding taxes. My understanding, I think we're at, we've collected um, four or five million, bringing us to approximately about $11 million still owed um by the city um we are looking at the special education um department in particular just to look at what we spent year over year how many students we have in the special education department just so we can kind of get a gauge on the spending in that department um and we are looking at, oh, and the building condition survey. And again, I know we, this is the most unpopular topic to ever bring up um, for everybody here, but building condition survey, just for everyone who doesn't know, is every five years, generally, right? Five years, yes. we do a building condition survey. And what that means is that we go out to every building, we have an independent party looking at the buildings and essentially they come in and say, hey, listen, these are all the repairs. There are repairs you have to make, life safety issues, there are repairs you should make, and then there are repairs that you could make. Um, for lack of a better, to really oversimplify it to a way that at least I understand it. Um, And we are expecting um, that there is going to be a high amount of um, repairs that we are going to anticipate to be making to the buildings. Um, Obviously, that money is not going to be coming out of the budget, so everybody should start thinking about um, bond money um, and that kind of thing. Um, I would remind everyone that many of our buildings are very, very old, um, and that tends to be an issue that we run into. And sorry, is that, is that this year that was going to happen? I think we're doing. We're isn't the we're BCS starting? Or? Yeah, the, 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 draft is, the draft is ready, for, so we're, we're very close. What is then we're going yeah, to share that the, with the board? Yeah, I'm sorry. Of I'm sorry, this is the fifth year and this is where it's happening, right? When we're doing right. the- So every every five years we do a BCS building condition survey and every year we do a visual inspection. So this is the, this is the big one every five years. We're actually doing it early this year. Uh, the state had uh, rearranged the schedules for many of the districts right. and we got pushed out to 2023, but given the age and condition of a lot of our buildings and knowing we couldn't accomplish everything in the last fund, we, we were proactive in that endeavor stuck to the 2020 schedule great and the hr committee met um and we reviewed um all of the the tabs coming up today um extensively and we kind of started getting off onto a tangent um i'm not going to point any fingers who did it i mean probably um but we started kind of talking about one of the goals that we have is really to not just attract good talent, but keep good talent and particularly our teachers and particularly, you know, our, any, any, let's be real. It's not even teachers. It's any staff member who touches a kid at any point in time, not inappropriate touching, just to be clear, (laughs) you know, affects their life in some way, shape or form. Um, And the truth of the matter is this currently as it stands, we are not the highest paid district. Let's be real. Right. 
Um, currently, as it stands, we're probably not in the top half of the districts. So the question is, what can we do to attract and keep talented people here? And it can't be just, hey, they're here because we, we need them here and they, they should feel needed because, you know, they have to pay their bills just like everybody else. So what we are kind of trying to work on in the HR committee is creative ways. Um, I apologize for my children, if in case you can hear them screaming. Um, but we're thinking about creative ways that we can go about um, and, and creative programs we can put in that would keep staff um, and that would show, you know, the staff that obviously were interested in, you know, making things more comfortable for them. Um, I don't want to give away all our secrets because, you know, these are top secret. Um, but we do have something kind of in the, that we're going to try to effectuate. And if we manage to get this one done, this would be a pretty big deal. And it, it would actually help the rest of the city, you know, at the same time. So that's great. Um, and and uh, Trustee Munoz, do you have an ETA? Do we have an ETA on when we could uh, finalize that? Um, well, I mean, stalking public officials is never a popular thing, um, especially when you say it publicly in forums like this. Uh, but I'm hoping I may have actually have a contact. I reach out to somebody. So if I do have a contact for this particular individual to reach out to, it would be we should have an answer, hopefully, by the end, I don't know, three months, four months. All right. Thank you. So is that all? Don't you have something to talk about about a community school? Oh, okay. Um, I don't have my notes for that. Okay. So um, we also met, um, I'm sorry, Cecilia. Shh. Um, we also met um, for the community school planning um, with Dr. BC and a number of the stakeholders. Um, as everybody know, well, I don't know if everyone knows, as everyone knows, I'm really excited about community schooling. Um, I'm excited about community buildings. I'm excited about building um, community, you know, building a community, having somewhere that people can go. Um, and the fact of the matter is we really have nowhere right now. Our kids don't have anywhere they can go. There's no why there's no, you know, whatever. Anyway. So, um, BC has been doing an amazing job. Um, we're looking to make Benjamin Turner middle school, a community school. Um, we had a planning meeting last week. Um, and we are looking to, I apologize, Cecilia, please <laughs> Shh. go find your dad. Um, so, <laughs> um, I completely lost my train of thought. All right. So, um, yes. So the meeting, um, went really well. We seem to have some really great individuals on our committees. Um, and I think we're meeting next week, BC. Um, not that I, you know, have any idea about what I'm supposed to be doing, but um, I'm hoping that'll change in the next day or two and somebody will save me and remind me what I'm supposed to be doing. But um, it's been, it's really great to see everybody coming together. The city's there represented uh, Mount Vernon Neighborhood um, Health Center. The health is, Center, yes. And the city, somebody from the city. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been really exciting. So that's the other thing that we're doing. Is that this is just that this is just the beginning, right? This is just starting out here, but yes. this, this is going to be something we're trying to move across the entire district, right? I think the primary, I mean, I, I can't speak for, you know, well, I guess the superintendent should do this one, but I'd like to see four. Like that would be like my goal would be, would be four great. buildings open that uh -huh. would be open until gosh knows when, uh -huh. and we yep. could have them in different areas. This And that could be like the hub for the kids, you know, to start getting together and, and, and really, you know, Again, building, rebuilding like the community is like a whole. So yes, thank, thank you, Trustee. So yes, there is a, the vision for it is to have a community school in the four corners of Mount Vernon. Uh, and uh, Benjamin Turner would be our pilot site uh, where we would get it up and running, um, identify our strengths and opportunities to to improve and then branch out and create other community schools uh, across the district. Um, I do have, I have, I did set up a community school in my two districts ago and it was hugely, hugely successful. Uh, and it can be when done right and the right partners are in place with community service providers and social service agencies. Uh, and so this is really an opportunity for us to deepen those partnerships 
um, and look at school in a very non-traditional lens in terms of its hour and scope of services and also recognizing that students are not our only clients. Um, members of our community and parents are also our clients in a community school concept. Um, and with that as the backdrop, uh, creating this, this entity, this organization that would serve our entire community. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. I think uh, Trustee Miller has another um, project that we're working on to report. Is that right, Trustee Miller? Do you want to report on your uh, community? Oh, yeah. Um, right. So we toured, uh, a group of us toured uh, some potential spaces to kick off the Parent Resource Center last week? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, whatever it was. <laughs> and um, we found some some potential spaces, We but we decided we want to start small in space that's going to require a... Uh, very, very little uh, renovation, and then and then figure out how to expand based on the utilization of services that we plan to offer. So um, the day after we toured, I went back with um, Ken Baviello agreed to come with me, and we we went and we looked at spaces and discussed pros and cons and possibilities. And um, he has subsequently done a rendering of what this particular room that Ms. Morales said she could uh, let us use would look like. And um, I know Dr. Bennett Conroy has this and uh, we're looking at it and we're looking at, um, you know, I think we need to make a decision on that fairly soon because we have to order some furniture, uh, which everything's back ordered. So anyway, but we do have, we do have a really nice rendering that um, Mr. Babiello did and I'm very excited about it. Um, and I think we're having a next meeting a meeting next week. I don't, I don't know if I can attend, but there's a meeting next Wednesday um, uh, to you know continue continue the, uh, the process. The idea is to be in the space, working on the space, prepping the space by the beginning of November, I think, end of October, beginning of November, and then have a a hard opening for the community in January. Um, well, can you share what services we're going to do there? Well, we're talking about we're we're trying to we're trying to nail that down, but we're talking about all sorts of questions that parents might have in terms of registration, how tos, how to do what, how to interface with the district. We're talking about how to how to how to do a resume. Uh, how to access social services, um, how to get you know extra help, uh, having a social worker there, uh, bilingual people working there, um, hopefully nurses there to attend to certain needs. So we're looking at the whole gamut, and I think we're prior the youth working with apparent liaisons and B all of BC's team. Um, looking at how to prioritize what we offer at first, uh, because there's just so many things, there's a plethora of things that we'd like to do, but just looking at what the parent liaisons feel uh, provide the greatest need. I think they're also gonna survey the community, BC. You're muted, but I know yes. you're saying they're, yes. Yes, they're gonna be um, a survey for the, to see what the community needs. Yeah. And we're going to do job training and all of that involved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, can I give a recommendation? Please do. Um, so one of the things, and I know this is part of the special ed committee, pro most probably, you know, but it would be nice if we could work together. One of the things that we should start training parents also is uh, special needs parents and how to do the whole process of the W, the OPWDD and the front doors. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents don't know whatsoever how to do it or how to go about it. Mm -hmm. Or they already have older children that, and don't even know what open doors are, or don't even know that what o, you know, OPWDD is. Okay. Um, that could be something that you could look into. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that the city will definitely help us out with that. Okay. Right. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I, I, think, I think once, once the, com the committee, the, the parent resource committee, the group, um, solidifies um, the, what, what they, we believe the priorities are, we'll present that BC, I guess we'll present that to the board 
Right. Um, and that's why we're going to meet on Wednesday to decide, you know, right. about the furniture and the services and how we're going to do that. So that's yeah. going to be a Wednesday meeting. Yep. Is, this, is this part of the, the parent communication committee or the parent committee? What is this it? Is just, this is just, uh, it's really, I mean, it's just a, it's an initiative under BC's wing uh, on the Parent Resource Center, which BC and I have been discussing for about five years. And she's probably right. been discussing before I even started discussing it. So it's just a kind of an ad hoc group. But this also, can, together. But we can also use the Parent Resource Center and the community-based school uh, together. So we can um, refer people from one center to the other, which is good. Yeah. Well, I also think that there's gonna be, and that's what I was just, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think there's gonna be some sort of overlap as well. Yeah. So I think that the Parent Resource Center is a great way to get that, those initiatives moving. Yes. And then once the, at some point, I don't mean to you know, be a little of the Parent Resource Center, but at some point, that it may be it may be absorbed by one of the community schools or it may be absorbed to some extent by all the community schools where let's say we have one major hub for the parent resource center which may be in one of the community schools and then the other community schools know that let's say whatever columbus is the school that we decide to go with that let's say if somebody benjamin turner has a question they can access they can you know communicate with the person at columbus who has that type of skill set or something yeah, yes, well, everything that everything that we're looking at that the committees looked at thus far mm -hmm. is scalable. So it's just a question of the, the whole idea here in terms of this initiative, this big push is to get something started. And then we start seeing what what the demand is for the services. And then and then clearly we'll need we'll need uh, we hope we'll need bigger space and that can be addressed as part of the community schools plan. It's great. Right. I have one more thing, um, the trustee Saunders, and that is that um, this morning, um, as part of the communications initiative, um, I met with with Dr. Gorman and Mr. McCormick. We met with Final Sight, three three members from Final Sight, the web developer, um, and uh, we basically discussed doing a multi phase uh, approach for. Um, updating the website and we are going to be getting uh, the, the net net of all the discussions They're They're fantastic. What they have is just fantastic in terms of the services and what they offer. Of course, I said, well, it just depends on how much it costs, but um, we're having a follow-up meeting next Wednesday morning um, to, to look at a phased in plan, starting with an implementation um, next second quarter okay great great news um anything else from you uh, trustee miller nothing from the finance or audit well audit we're going to be meeting uh in a, in a couple of weeks we're going to set up that meeting uh to talk about the you know the finalization of the current audit and then the special uh the special deep dive that we're going to be doing and i'm going to be communicating with you on that in between sometime in the next week or two. Thank you. Sorry, Darcy, is that also an order for the special education? Um... That is going to be, that is going to be the, um, the first deep dive that audit does this year. Yes. And that, that oh, we, because of the, we're shorthanded and because we had to get our larger audit done, um, we can't start it until October. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, trustee, uh, trustee, so are you um, are you going to um, start the um, school renaming committee again? Did you say my name? Because I had feedback when you were saying the name. Did you say mine? I did. Yes, I am. I will be uh, uh, chairing that committee again starting uh, in the next week or so. I'll be reaching out to the two schools that we had targeted for renaming. So what we need to do is we need to set up um, times when we're going to have our meetings and have Rick put them on everyone's calendar, okay? Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. also need to know what schools each trustee is owning. You know, mm -hmm. there's questions about what schools tr each trustee is going to manage or oversee or or just take care of. So can you can you all give Rick that information so he can share with everyone? 
Rick <laughs> already, Rick already, um, I thought Rick, you already posted something that showed schools that we, we had. How long ago was that? Like two weeks ago or two months I, ago? If memory serves me, um, we carried over and the, we carried over the assignments from the last school year and we needed to just assign schools to those trustees who have joined us since July. Okay. All right. So Can we uh, reshare that for people. Let's just pretend we don't please, remember. Please. Yeah, because I don't. <laughs> I will send it out first thing in the morning. Thank also, you. And, also, and put the committee uh, dates of meetings so we could, um, you know, I have a, a special ed um, committee report. Great. Working with Rachel DePaul on uh, starting our Pioneer League, our Special Olympics for our students with special mm -hmm. needs. Some of our students go out and uh, uh, right, I think your phone is. Um, so uh, some of our special needs students go to other schools and play sports, whether it's basketball or baseball. So but we're starting that back. Um, uh, we have a teacher that's been doing it for years, and he's um, he's uh, going to start something I think sometime in October. Uh, the Special Olympics. Um, also, uh, Miss um, Dr. B. C. And informed us that we have some funding, some grant money that we can start an after school program for our special needs students. So we have more to come on that. Also, we're having a special education forum that's going to take place virtually October 13th, 530 to 8, and we'll have a virtual event forums. So you can go into each, you can go into breakout rooms and learn different things on um, whatever interests you. And Trustee Sorensen, you may want to. Um, work with me on that to help me um, get that started. Most definitely. Is okay. that the rescheduled thing from the other yes. Saturday? It's the rescheduled because we didn't want to have it September 11th. So we rescheduled to October 13th, 530 to 8. Okay, and I hope all will be able to attend. Uh, I don't have anything else on for my committee. Does anybody else have any other committee reports? Trustee White, Trustee uh, The student report, Madam President, no. student trustee report. Okay. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Um, this report is just basically off of my experience is what I've observed so far. Um, I'm proud to report that I haven't seen any significant issues, you know, throughout my entire school experience, going to school every single day, people have their masks on, people are happy, um, the hallways aren't crowded. Um, I'm not gonna lie, last year, a big issue for a lot of my classmates they complained about was the fact that we didn't have always have soap and paper towels and stuff. Now, every single classroom that we walk into, there's a bottle of hand sanitizer. We have paper towels. Inside all the bathrooms, there was soap constantly. We never had to ask. So I want to say thank you guys. You've done an amazing job. And the students are definitely happy. And they told me to tell you guys that. Oh, thank you. Right. Thank, thank you, Johnny. You. Appreciate that. Share, you want to share to the public what school you went to? I go to the Denzel Washington School of the Arts. Okay, great. Any other reports? Okay, let's move on with our meeting. Human resources, Rick, HR 6.1. Isn't there a presentation, Dr. Hamilton? Um, yes, Mr. Policio, where are you? Um, we are going to talk about our effort to, um, yes, the DEI policy, our efforts to um, roll out this policy with all of our vendors and contractors. Um, uh, district staff will also receive, actually they got it today, a notification about um, signing off on mandatory policies. So the DEI policy has been added to our mandatory policy review and affirmation lists uh, and SS and they must sign an attestation that they have reviewed uh, the policy and this is among them. So um, Michael Policcio and Amy Mozelli have done a great effort with pulling together the work on around the DEI policy and how we will notify all of our vendors about the expectation uh, regarding their compliance. Um, so they have put together a video presentation as a part of the training module um, to notify folks about how serious 
we are taking our DEI policy. Thanks, Dr. Hamilton. Amy um, has got the PowerPoint all ready to go, and um, it, great, it's great stuff. Amy? Okay. Uh, Amy, you should be able to share. Okay, no problem. Okay. Seems to... Let's see if that works. Oh my goodness, it's not really sharing. Why is that? Hold on a second. I'm sorry. Um, Rick, would you mind uh, putting that presentation up and I can tell you when to fast forward? There's something happening here where it's not allowing me to share. One second. Thank there you. you Thank you very much. So um, as Dr. Hamilton shared with you, the, it was the hope of the business office to get ahead of this um, much anticipated policy that we had heard about, the DEI policy, and we were following your iterations as you were developing it. And one of the reasons the business office decided to take the lead is because um, in this policy, there's definitely a component of the policy's mandate that uh, has an immediate effect on the way that we conduct our business in the business office. We decided to partner very early on with Mr. Policcio and with Kim Baviello to try and come up with a plan that makes sense. Although, of course, what we're going to be proposing here applies to any number of, of um, vendors. It would apply to special education vendors. It would apply to uh, vendors in the buildings and grounds department, uh, et cetera. So please go ahead. As we navigate through this presentation, it's really been broken down into a two tier system, tier one and tier two. So think of tier one as the new vendors and tier two as the existing vendors, because uh, we wanted to make sure that our approach to onboarding this policy made sense and would be something that could be seamless. Please carry on. In looking at your policy and extracting the parts of the policy that truly lend themselves the work that we do every day in the business office, we quickly noticed that the policy has both a qualitative component and a quantitative component. And we wanted to address that in an authentic manner. Think of the qualitative component, which is the blue as the why and the how, and the quantitative component, which is the green as the what and the who. On the qualitative side, the policy clearly states that we're mandated to ensure that the historical injustices and inequities that have shaped our society um, are, are brought to light and that those who do business with the city of Mount Vernon and the city school district of Mount Vernon recognize and help to eliminate these institutional barriers, including racism and bias. So this is a this is this is an educational part of the of the policy where we um, view ourselves as now being mandated to engage with our vendors to educate them about the history and its impact and um, their role and responsibility in ensuring that that changes. Um, on the quantitative side, which is the green, here we see ourselves as being directed to do things that have um, something that is measurable and something for which we can provide you um, like a, a monitoring report to the superintendent. Here, we have to make sure that our contractors and vendors and partners are interacting and doing business with um, the district, Have make sure that they have a diverse staff, that they have inclusion policies, and that they are committed to the essence of this policy. Moreover, we want to make sure that those contractors uh, hire, utilize local employees from Mount Vernon and from uh, historically marginalized groups, especially those um, uh, that, who perform work in our district. So um, at the, for the quantitative side, we hope that we can demonstrate that we are holding our contractors to this very high threshold and bar by developing monitoring reports that we would give the superintendent of schools. Next. So keep in mind that we talked about qualitative and quantitative and the blue, which is the circle that you see on the left there, relates to the qualitative. So, and we have two tiers, tier one and tier two. So on the qualitative side, for tier one, which would be new vendors, we are um, proposing that the plan be that all vendors must demonstrate and ensure that their employees have access and opportunities to doing undoing racism training and implicit bias training. But moreover, 
they must do a mandatory two house undoing racism and or implicit bias training in Mount Vernon. And that would require that they send their principals um, to the district to engage in a, a training seminar that would be um, housed in house. And um, the way that their life cycle would be would be that they would um, we would edit. If you can see at the bottom of the, of the screen, you would have to edit the RFP and bond uh, bid language to ensure that it reflects our new uh, policy and its uh, requirements. Then you would have to mandate the in-house training, and then you would have to encourage them uh, to continue their education individually and, um, and also mandate them to uh, ensure that they have access to professional development in their own circles for their own um, employees. Next. So again, still on the qualitative side, but tier two would be for existing contractors. So for those who are existing this year, as we transition into the full implementation of this plan, in this 2021-2022 school year, we are recommending that these vendors be told that they should um, offer uh, undoing, uh, bias, uh, undoing racism and um, uh, implicit bias training, and that they are able to take our two-hour undoing racism training in-house. It, it would be highly, highly recommended to them. Um, however, by the end of the year and as we uh, enter into next year, we would go out to bid and any further involvement with us would then go into the same high level of rigor that a new um, contractor would have to get into. So you, they would have to take the mandated training that would no longer be optional and they would have to demonstrate that they offer um, continuous professional development education in this area for their employees. That's how we wanted to address this qualitative side, this very important part of demonstrating what the historical impact has been of the foot of suppression and, and historic uh, injustices and, um, and institutional racism. Next. Here we enter into the, the other side of the equation, which was the qualitative part, the green, the qualitative part. Again, we have a two-tiered system for new, new uh, uh, vendors and uh, then, of course, the uh, existing vendors. So for the new vendors here on the qualitative side, we want to make sure that they have a robust DEI policy themselves. And if they don't, they would have to become signatory onto our own much like the attestation that Dr. Hamilton is making your employees um, take. So it's a matter of really ensuring that they are either able to demonstrate that their own company has committed to DEI at the same level that we have, or that they are now committed to um, signing on to what we believe is uh, the minimum, minimal threshold. Um, uh, also, uh, we would want to make sure that we were tracking their employees and ensuring that they were um, hiring local uh, people and that from uh, communities that were historically marginalized groups to ensure that, of course, the essence of the policy that you guys passed was actually uh, fully implemented. Um, there are very specific steps that we would want to take to make sure that they are really changing the, the way in which they are conducting business in, in order to get a foothold in this, in this district. We also would, as I said earlier, provide monitoring reports to the superintendent, and this would be the data tracking that would be necessary to ensure that even if a contractor entered the district because they met the thresholds necessary to say that they are um, they have a diverse staff, for example, or that their hiring practices are in line with our DEI policy, we would need to make sure that those practices continued as we continued our engagement with them. So as we continue to pay them, so too with the tracking continue of their data. Next. So tier two is again, still on the quantitative side, but it's the vendors that exist. So for those who exist, we would encourage them to take a look at our DEI policy. We would highly recommend that they sign on to our DEI policy. However, at this point, we would be taking the opportunity to learn a little bit more about contractors by surveying them and really getting to understand how many of them have their own DEI policies. Uh, we would also take a close look at their certified payroll, which I'm going to walk, uh, walk you through in a moment, to get a better idea, understanding of exactly what the demographics are of those who work in some of the larger contracts and contracting firms, um, and even um, th th that work in the city school district. Um, and then we would want to present that data to the superintendent of schools as well. So not only do we want to track the new vendors to ensure they continue to comply, but we would want to, at this point, look at all of the existing vendors because it really serves as valuable data in terms of setting realistic goals and targets. Next. 
This is what certified payroll looks like. So every person who works in the district as a contractor is provide, must provide certified payroll to us. This happens to be our elevator vendor. So Kone, you can say, see that uh, name at the top left. Um, the, pers- the black box covers the employee's personal name because I just thought that it'd be best to redact that. But you can see in that red circle that the uh, race or ethnicity is identified as white. And that is true for every uh, certified payroll. So when we talk about doing a deep dive and really looking at who is working here and what is the composition of the various crews for the contractors that work here in Mount Vernon, it isn't just a, a cursory sort of like observation. It's, it's actually driven by data and um, these certified payrolls, which are, are sworn uh, certified payrolls. So they are, they are very accurate. Uh, next. So what's going on and what are the steps? From 30,000 uh, foot view in terms of our plan, this is what we envision and this is what we hope the board will support. We envision that we would need to revise our bid documents and our RFP language that would require work with Ingerman and Smith to make sure that the um, DEI language is infused into our documents so that people understand what exactly is required of them if they are to uh, bid and and gain any kind of contract in this district. And so it will change the bar in order to be a a lowest responsible bidder. Part of that responsible bidder piece will be that you acknowledge all of the stuff that's included in the DEI and that you're willing to sign on. The second is that we need to work to define as a group in the business office. We really need to work to design the percentages, what percentage of local employment and what percentage of minority employment Um, is going to be required on a contract by contract basis based on the industry norms. So it's not a one size fit all, but rather we would need to be very mindful about what we're trying to do to set realistic goals that maybe push the edge and create a growing edge, but also doesn't create a situation where we simply don't have people who can bid and people who couldn't be responsible, responsive bidders because the targets are too high. So it's in this step here that looking at historical data and working with our current vendors is going to end up being very fruitful because we'll be able to see some vendors are doing better than others. And we'll be able to to sort of figure out what industry norms are also by doing some um, analytical research, all of which would be shared with the superintendent prior to setting these targets as firm in a, in a, in a bid or an RFP, we would um, share with the superintendent how these targets were developed, but they're going to be developed um, by statistical analysis. It's not going to be a random or a, a gut feeling. Um, in terms of the DEI policy, as we stated, they, that policy in its full form would be shared with all of our vendors. They could either sign on to it or they could create their own. In, in many ways, if your policy could inspire them to create their own that is a custom for their, their own company, that shows a higher level of engagement. And that's something that we should certainly um, support. We should certainly support them trying to make their own DEI policies if theirs is as robust as yours is. Um, and the next piece is something that Dr. Hamilton teed us up for when he gave us the floor, which is to define what this in-house training will look like. So we've begun to do this. Uh, we have a pretty solid idea of what we would like that two-hour journey in Mount Vernon to look like for those who are interested in working here. We've begun to pitch parts of it to the superintendent and um, quite recently, and we're hoping for some feedback. And as that becomes more refined, then we could come back to you and present on that piece alone, because that's a very important piece of the qualitative aspect of your policy. And we feel like that's an incredibly important mandate. Um, so that is underway. And, and uh, we'll, we'll, you know, should the superintendent give us another platform to share that with you, we'll happy to do that. And then the last piece is really, it's where all of the hard work is, but it's well worth it. It's to truly go through every certified payroll um, in the same way that you would review it to pay. Now there's be a second level of analysis was as you review it to make sure it's accurate for payment, you would review it for the rich data that it will provide us in terms of showing us where we can make measurable gains, particularly with our vendors that exist today. Next. So this is the last slide. It shows you a really clear line of what we hope we're going to be accomplishing. We wanted to present this process to you uh, in in terms of the qualitative and quantitative aspects. We wanted to present it to you in terms of a tier one and tier two. So really it's four quadrants. 
we, we hope that you support the direction that the business office has taken. We, we Once you do, we, we will eagerly start to work with um, Ingerman and Smith to try and uh, refine our language because we certainly will be going out to bid and be issuing RFPs. Uh, we do that all the time. We actually go out to RFP all the time. We have two RFPs out right now, one for landscaping and one for waste management. Um, and then we would like to propose and show this new language that would be in our documentation to Dr. Hamilton. I don't uh, believe that it would warrant a public presentation, but he is, uh, could certainly share it with the Board of Education. And then um, we would have meetings. Once this has been developed, we would have meetings with our um, existing vendors and with new vendors to set expectations and to let them know how very committed we are to these uh, benchmarks and that these are not these are not soft lines in the sand. These are um, you know really material commitments that are not only codified in policy but certainly speak to the spirit of everything that underpins what we do in Mount Vernon. So thanks. Thanks, Abe. Okay. It's great. So I, I just want to add one thing. Um, so I know we use the word contractors a lot in that language, but this district has three thousand vendors. And all have to comply to DEI. So it's a big, it's a big footprint and a really big undertaking, but we're really excited to work on it. Thank you. I'm excited to hear. Thank That's you. great. It looked, I mean, once again, you know, we're we're at the we're at the front of this, and I I'm really I'm really proud of us for doing this. I think it's great. It's a great initiative. So kudos to the administration. Great That's presentation, Amy. Very good, Amy. A lot of corporations are doing this now. Yes. And I think it's great. I think it's great. Um, how soon will this go into effect? Well, technically, once you voted on the policy, it is in effect. So is, yeah. the right. only way that the, okay. the only thing that's holding us uh, uh, back is that you, the, 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 you don't want to roll something out like this. That's this important without it being very strategically thought mm -hmm. out. And given that this was a board policy that the superintendent holds very near and dear to his heart, we wanted to make sure that we were very thoughtful and mindful about the way in which we were going to introduce this policy. And so if you agree um, or can bless the framework that was just presented to you, then we can start to accelerate um, you know, implementing this. You have my blessing. Mm -hmm. So I have one more question. So each application will have the person's ethnicity on it? Each application, um, Trustee Red, each application, you mean district employee or vendor? Well, not even a district employee, it would be the vendor, the vendors. And, you know, because, and, and also what I'm concerned about too is to make sure that the people of Mount Vernon get the work as well. You know, that's the, the so, so this important. is a really wonderful point. It was discussed in our first, we have, a, we had our first community outreach meeting just the other day. And this was one of the topics that was brought up. So at the end of the day, the way that we want to um, ensure that the spirit of this policy is implemented is by putting measurable goals in the contract language. So that is to say that a percent of your hires via, via subcontractors, for example, need to be local, local business enterprises or minority business enterprises. Um, so there are ways in which the, the, the essence of what we want to do can be implemented and can be tracked via data. Um, in terms of whether or not the owner he, themselves is a person uh, of color or is a, a person who has been historically marginalized, that is not going to be as easy to control because at the end of the day, we still have to go out for bid and we still want the lowest responsible bidder. But no matter who gets that contract, we can ensure that the people who are working here meet our targets because those targets will be built into the bid language so that anyone who even applies to work here understands what's expected of them. So we'll be relying basically on a lot of data. And um, I wonder if a committee or something like that we can put together to maybe, and maybe I'm just, just being a little out there, but to go around these sites when they're working and just to see exactly what's going on and how diverse the group, the, the group of people are. The main thing um, that we, we need is, is, first of all, to, we cannot say that work will be exclusive to Mount Vernon residents. So we had to be careful about the legitimacy of that because that would suggest we are um, 
effectively discriminated against other vendors. We can, however, give preference to conditions of the bid, um, all things being equal, to businesses that are in Mount Vernon. Um, but it's also important for these vendors and potential contractors that are local in and around Mount Vernon in particular to take advantage of these training workshops, these trainings that are coming up in information sessions so that they are well prepared when a bid comes up that they can be in line and have their credentials uh, in place so that they can be appropriately um, considered. So like the, the session we had the other day, albeit short notice, we only had two people there. Um, so this has been in the works and it's really important to help get the word out. We'll reach out to, to the Chamber of Commerce as well uh, and, and solicit their support. Uh, but we got to get people who are interested in getting some of these contracts in our community in these sessions so that they can be trained and orientated appropriately so that they're in the best possible position. Do we have another date um, planned already so everyone can know ahead of time? Is that next date planned yet, Michael? I didn't see uh, it on my calendar. We don't have it on our, on our calendar yet. We, um, the, the president and the vice president of the Board of Education were part of the first one and we are gonna make it uh, available to everyone. All the board yeah, and, and, anybody come and, on come on bring everybody yeah, and, and as soon as you find out you know please let let us know so we can get Absolutely the word out there i found out about it like last minute yes sir yeah we, it was put together okay. really quick the first one we'll, yeah we'll, okay. we'll have a whole schedule yes sir. all right thank you You're thank you thank you dr hamilton okay thank you that is it for thank this you. uh uh, presentations of the superintendent's report. Can, Mike, can I just make a Mike comment about the policy? Yes. Sorry, you can hear me. Sorry, my connection is not great. Sorry, I, I dropped off for a minute. Um, thank you for the presentation. That was that was excellent. Um, I just want to say, obviously, at least as long as I've been on the board, we have always, you know, uh, been looking for opportunities and ways to get local contractors and other vendors involved in the school district. Um, we have always been open to that and welcome that business. The purpose of this policy is to try and formalize that and to make it, you know, to, to remove any possible excuses uh, from doing everything we can to give every advantage to, to local vendors and vendors who have historically struggled to get, to get the work. Um, so we, I mean, we can, we have, but we have to be met halfway, right? We, we as a district have responsibility to the taxpayers to, uh, you know, take a lowest response bidder and, and to get people who are qualified and licensed and all of that. Um, but within that pool, we hope that, or especially over time, this will increase, right? The purpose of this policy is not to reduce the number of vendors we hire. It's to increase the number of vendors we hire, right? That's the point. Uh, and this and change does not happen overnight. So I appreciate the the strategy that this is the goal. The, the, this I think this presentation tonight I hope proves to the community that we are taking this policy seriously. It is very easy and very in vogue right now for different organizations to go onto Google and take a DEI policy and say, "Oh, look how great we are." That is not what this is about. Right, we're trying to take this seriously and actually affect long-term change, and that's why, for example, like we at the policy committee level, we went back and forth for quite a while about do we actually put some hard numbers into the policy? And there's a variety of reasons, and you know, um, legal and otherwise, why that wasn't considered the best option at the policy level. But I hope that it's clear to everyone, um, and I appreciate the business office presentation taking it seriously right like the goal is to increase the number and quality of vendors from all backgrounds uh, who can help our city and help our students grow and to the extent at all possible use local people to do that so I think that these are the type what you're describing is how we're going to turn this policy from mm -hmm. just words you know on a website and make it actually real and that is absolutely the goal so I appreciate that 
Great. Any other questions? Any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, so let's move on. I have to, um, Trust McCowan, are you going to chair the um, CTE um, committee? Yes, so that is that is continuing. We need to get another date on the calendar with you and with Billings. Everything at the end of the summer and with Ida has been kind of gone out the window in terms of you know renovations at the high school. The high school has major emergency repairs it has to deal with now. So I don't. I don't know how quickly we're going to be renovating space for the CDZ program in the next month or two, but yes, I have not forgotten and we need to have another meeting, especially with, um, with uh, Dr. Bobble's replacement. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, we finished committee reports. Now we go to HR. Rick, do you want to read that resolution? Yes, ma'am. Everybody hear me okay? Yes, we do. All right, we need a motion to approve resol uh, human resources resolution 6.1, um, resolution number 43A, certified 43B, non certified dated September 20th, 2021. Motion. Second. Right. Questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? No, I'm sorry, I wasn't opposed. I say aye, by the way. Aye, okay. <laughs> Abstain. Motion carries. A motion to approve resolution 6.2, the authorization to hire staff for the Mount Vernon Aquatic Facility. Motion. Second. Trustee Saunders. Trustee McOwen. Questions, comments, concerns? All right. Seeing none. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. How are we going to hire these? people. Right, what are the qualifications? What are we looking for? How are we going to go about it? They've already been identified here. What, are you, are you are you I think you're muted. Were you? I am. Was the superintendent answering and he was muted? No, Candace, I heard you. I, don't, I thought the superintendent sorry, I didn't realize answered. I was muted. I'm sorry, trustee. I don't even know, don't know when I did that. Um, no worries. No worries. The, <laughs> the, these folks have already been identified and onboarded through the traditional posting and application process. Okay. Okie dokie. Can, can you, like, what is the overall, like, plan and structure for the aquatics program for this mm -hmm. school year? Because this is clearly different than what happened over the summer. So yes, yeah, so, so we do have this partnership with um, two different entities. Um, and our goal of course is to expand the swimming pool so that it is fully actualized. Um, I think this is a huge step in that direction where it actually, where it actually becomes um, a money maker for the district or if certainly uh, sustain the maintenance costs for the pool. Um, so you'll be getting more information once we get beyond this and get schedules in place um, for those um, that are currently on this tab in terms of what their availability looks like based on the number of people who express interest. And then we'll go back to adding family swim and um, family swim and open swim and swim lessons uh, and expand that until all lanes are utilized and we are generating sufficient income to sustain the maintenance and upkeep. But again, over, yeah. overall, the program is we're, we're partnering with two organizations, but we're supplying the instructors or they're supplying the instructors? They provide a, a fee. These folks are being hired through us. Yeah. And there is a rental fee or a usage fee. Um, that's assessed to to these vendors to support the pool. But are we, I'm just confused. So I know we hire the lifeguards. We have an aquatic advisor to kind of supervise. But then these programs are going to come in with their own personnel and do the actual teaching. Yes. And they make it and it's it's um, effectively like having, for lack of a better way to describe it, they are effectively a, a third party that works in our district uh, to ensure our pool is maximized. 
Right. And Avit, this is for their own, is it for Mountain Vernon students only or anybody involved in those programs? Both. Well, I guess the only part wouldn't be applicable. So it's yes, it's for Mount Vernon students and students involved in their programs. Okay. And this is, right, so it's weekday evenings and Saturdays. Correct. Are these organizations going to provide discounts to Mar Mount Vernon students or residents? That I don't know. Mr. Policcio, have you had that conversation with these groups? Yes. Hello, everybody, again. Um, so as Dr. Hamilton um, explained, it's a community-based program. There are two tiers to this program as well. We seem to be in the tier phase. Um, the first tier is a beginner program. That's Bronx Swim handles that. They share a lane with our community swim. So what happens is when you come to community swim, there's also instruction going on. In, in lanes adjacent to where the community is swimming. So it's kind of a feeder program to the beginning. That's the person who hasn't put their toe in the water yet. And then when, when we get an advanced swimmer in Mount Vernon or anywhere in the, in the area, um, Westchester Aquatics will take them from their point. So they need a little bit more of an advanced person. And yes, there is a count at both sides of that, both at the advanced with through Westchester Aquatics and at the beginner level with um, Bronx Swim. So we're really excited. It, we have all lanes are filled almost every day and we're, we've really packed the pool in. And actually, Nurochelle is, um, we're, we're helping our sister city through their problems that they're having. So we've been in some lanes during our swim program as well, during our high school swim team. So we're, we're, we're moving on all cylinders in the pool. So Mike, what I was asking was our, for example, Westchester Aquatic, are they going to provide discounts to our residents? Yes. In our school? yes. So our residents, anybody from the Mount Vernon community gets a discounted rate, both from Westchester Aquatic and Bronx Swim, both of them offering discounted rates to our people, to our residents. Thank you. You're welcome. And is the, the cost of this resolution offset by the rental fees from these organizations? So yes. So, um, like, let's take again, my, uh, Go ahead, go ahead, Michael. You're fine. Oh, yes. So, um, yes, um, like take Westchester Aquatics, for instance, Dr. Gorman was, was going to speak on this a little bit later um, during the pool resolution. But yes, so whatever we, we take in a certain amount of money and our revenue is, I believe, almost double that um, on, on the, that's not the expense of the pool, though. That's not the, of course. Yeah. the chemicals and everything. It's just, yes, yeah. that we are in the, in the black, not the red, the black. Yeah. No, of course. I mean, we, we spent millions and millions of dollars on this pool. We're not in the, not in the black yet, but yeah, that's the concept. Understood. Thank you. Welcome. Don't be so negative. We're not in the black yet. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. Trust me. We, so are we voting on this now? Yes. No more questions, comments. All right. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Aye. Oh, I abstain. I abstain. Trustee and abstains. Thank you, ma'am. All right, resolution 6.3, the authorization to pay staff for bus duty. Do we have a motion? Motion. Trustee Saunders? We have a second. second. Trustee Patterson? Mm -hmm. I'm on the board. Go me. Questions, comments, concerns. I have a question. Do you hear me? We hear you. Yes, Wanda. Um, I know at one time we talked about this and we were deciding on making non-teaching uh, like a stipend for these bus duties. We have right. teachers that are doing this bus duties. First of all, I don't know how they right now is okay because buses are so late but i still don't know how teachers are um being able to leave their classroom so early we have on the bus trustee white we um put a committee together today i appointed a committee to work with the union to develop that very to address that very issue through the negotiation of a non-instructional rate right. 
um, and versus an instructional rate as per the negotiated agreement. So that process is underway. Um, and as soon as we get an, an update, uh, we'll be able to uh, give you, share with the board where we are relative to that and what kinds of activities will constitute non-instructional rates. Bus duty would certainly fall in that category, in my view anyway. Um, and then we can share that with the board. And you know what, uh, uh, well, since we're gonna start giving, um, you know, when, when we start giving out hot breakfast in the morning, there's gonna be an arrival earlier. So, I mean, does that impact uh, that rate also? How does that work? It won't impact the rate. It may impact availability. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or it may expand um, the need, frankly, um, but it will. It, I don't see how it can impact the rate. And another thing, I um, because of the bus uh, bus driver shortage, a lot of the bus um, the monitors, the ones that put the kids on and off the bus, um, they they staying beyond their time. Like if it's a one hour after school. A lot of them are staying beyond their time. Can that be changed because of the bus um, coming late? Some buses are coming very late at different schools because they're making two and three pickups. And um, I, I think we can address that. Hopefully, it will. That will subs, uh, subside. I do know that um, they are offering uh, signing bonuses for people who want to be bus drivers to address that need. Um, but that's certainly something we can we can look at as we continue to assess how this bus shortage impacts um, the safe arrival and safe and on time arrival and pickup of our students. Right. OK. So okay. Have we reached out, I'm sorry. Have we reached out to all the teacher assistants to see if they want to do this? That's uh, usually a, well, the building principal appoints the bus monitors, I believe. Is that right, Dr. Hamilton? Well, yeah, well, there's a posting that goes out and people express their interest um, based on the posting. Uh, and so that's how these jobs get filled. So people have to express an interest in order to even get on the agenda. I would imagine if there aren't enough people, the bus, the principals probably do. I remember when I was a principal, I would have to go around and beg and negotiate with people to do bus duty. So that there may be some of that going on. Okay, thank you. Where are we? Um, motion. Where are we? Ready? All right. We have a motion by Trustee Saunders and a second by Melissa Patterson. If there's no more discussion, I can take the vote. Seeing Aye. none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now vote. <laughs> Opposed. <laughs> Abstain. Motion carries. We need a motion to approve business office resolution seven point one, approval of annual field trips for the twenty one twenty two school year. Motion. Second. Second. Trustee Mitchell. Was that Mitchell? This time. Right. Mitchell. And a second. Mitchell and Sorensen. Any questions? Question, comments? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm not used to seeing it done this way. I mean, we usually do field trips kind of as they come up in a and we know which school. I don't even know which grades, which schools, any of this involves. These are just kind of blanket approvals for any class of any school to go to these places. No, there's supplemental uh, paperwork that's going to get submitted. If you read further down, Micah. Yeah. It says in, in the fine print below, it says that the schools will still be providing sheets of uh, information about who's going, what classes, whatever. This is just the locations that we intend to send field trips to. Correct. I no, I understand that, but I don't. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember ever doing it this way before. Are you yeah. trying something new for for efficiency, or what's why are Looks we doing like this? it to me? Yes, what we've been working on doing is trying to get uh, everything on for board members in a timely fashion, based on the season that we anticipate these approvals, uh, so we don't have late submissions or we have five schools on and two are not, et cetera. So this is a process we're trying to utilize uh, to be more timely with uh, your approval and um, make sure that you have the information you need uh, when those uh, tabs with greater specificity are submitted. I guess, how, how are you, I mean, in concept, I'm fine, but how are you making decisions about like COVID, for example, 
like some there's some places where a day trip is fine, but an overnight trip would not be okay. And it it will be a case by case basis. It'll depend on it will depend on when the trip is scheduled to occur. It'll depend on when the venues, what protocols are in place for the venues where the trips are going. So I wouldn't I can't give you a blanket answer because it is absolutely going to vary um, based on circumstances and timing. Right now, for example, if we were doing a great adventure trip, which won't happen until the spring, I would have a very different position on approval or recommendation on that versus where we were this past June. So it would all depend. All right, I, I mean, I still think we should do a case by case to the board. That's my opinion. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I'm late, but aye. Aye for yes. <laughs> opposed? I'm opposed. Okay. Abstain? Motion carries. All right. Motion to approve school improvement uh, service memorandum S22-7 dated September 21st, 2021. Motion. Second. Trustee White. And was that Trustee Red? Trustee Mitchell again? Nope. It was both me and McGowan. Take Did your you pick. Take your pick. <laughs> we'll give it to Mr. McOwen this time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns? All right. Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. No motion to approve student services memorandum number five, dated September 21st, 2021. Motion. Trustee McOwen. Second. Second. Trustee White. Questions, comments, concerns? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Motion to approve superintendent's resolution dated September 21st, 2021. Motion. Motion. Second. This is what we just discussed in exact. Some of it. Yes. Some of it. Not all of it. Yes, yeah, some of it. Correct. Some okay. of it. Motion. All right. Questions, comments, and concerns? Nope. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. And final 11.2 authorizes an agreement for Westchester County and or any other entity to facilitate the district's ability to opt into the Westchester County COVID-19 school screening and testing program during the 21-22 school year. Do we have a motion? Motion. Motion. Second. Saunders? Second. Second, Trustee Sorensen. So is this, just, is this just for the, um, the students and faculty that work for the school district? If someone comes in and wants a COVID test, can they get it? If someone off the street comes in? Um, this is for staff. Uh, we have a requirement to test staff members who do not share their vaccination status or who are not vaccinated. And then we have an obligation to test 20% of our student population. So this is not yet available for members of the community. But didn't we just um, have a partnership with two different organizations to come yes. provide COVID testing? Yes, that's different. That's different than what this represents. So we do have a partnership with, a, with another entity that... Yes, yes that, but that's not what this tab is for. But we do have something where someone can come in off the street and get a test? Yes, ma'am. Right. Well, will that be in that? Well, no, not this one. Okay. This is not in every school. It will be. When it's implemented, it will be. 
The goal is to have a um, testing site in every school, a saliva uh, test um, that will be available in every school on a specific schedule um, so that staff members will know if I work at Rebecca Turner on Tuesdays from 9 to 10 or 9 to 12, whatever it is, if I need to get a test, um, I can go downstairs, get the specimen, uh, leave my um, specimen there for pickup and testing, and it will be returned with the results. Right now, the two entities are at Mount Vernon High and at Edward Williams, that is a nasal swab. That is what we're using pending the implementation of this agreement that's before you this evening. Plus, and, and so once we partner with the rest of what the rest of Westchester, that's what this is for, right? Yep. To do COVID testing. Will that replace our partnership with other two testing organizations or just supplement it? It will be in addition to. Wonderful. So to recap, the partnership with the two organizations is for voluntary testing as opposed to what we're trying to do with the rest of Westchester schools, which is under the governor's new directive is, man is mandatory testing where we have to do it. Correct, but they could also do the mandatory testing under the existing partnership as well. Sure. Right. Okay. Right, any other question? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Uh, motion to accept the minutes of July 27th. Motion. Thank you. Trustee Mitchell, tr Trustee um, Saunders, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? I abstain. Trustee McOwen abstains. Motion carries. And motion to accept the minutes of July the 6th, 2021. Motion. motion. Trustee Saunders, second. Second. Trustee McOwen. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Abstaining. I think I was out that meeting. Trustee Mitchell. No, you were there. No, you there? were there. You were sworn in. Oh, there. thank you. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> I missed one of these recently. <laughs> Motion <laughs> carries. Um, before we start, I just want to get a head count for tomorrow so Rick can order food. Okay, thank you, Trustee Sarn. Well, where, where are we ordering from? What will it take to get you to come there? <laughs> and will, will Rick deliver for those of us that are unable to attend? Well, Not because they don't want to do anything. Just ask. We'll let you see it. <laughs> you see it, Melissa. I'll be remote. I'll be remote. All right, so we, have, you. so we do we have a quorum, Rick? Everybody's available. It's just a matter of who will be in person and who will be there uh, uh, um, and who will be home. Well, how, many home how many home screens can you have? <laughs> many, can do I, I would prefer people to be there. I mean, we had already scheduled this back in July. I know there's some extenuating circumstances, but... Uh, Do we have a head count? Is what my question is. Are you are you asking me? Yes. Okay. So by my last counting, um, Trustee Miller, Trustee White, and Trustee Saunders indicated that they could arrive in person. Um, Trustee Patterson, Trustee McOwen, Trustee Mitchell um, opted to or uh, said that they would come via um, Skype. I think Trustee Red did as well. Um, and I have not heard directly from Trustee Sorensen, but I did hear indirectly that I believe she'd be here in person. In person, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have so we have five four in persons. Four in persons, one not available, and four uh, the uh, the. Trustee Mitchell, Trustee Mitchell and Trustee Red, are you not coming? No, they're on Zoom. I'm asking them. I'll try them. Oh. I'll try to make it tomorrow, but I know we had something else planned last um, already from July, but I'll try to make it. 
I would do my very best know. to be there live and live and in person. I would I, do my best. I appreciate this. I really do. All right. So with that said, uh, motion to adjourn. Any other question? It's getting late. Motion. Motion. Second. Second. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Thank good you. night all. Thanks. 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 Than